Yep, and you got your sharp focus and everything. Mm -hmm. Golden. Sweet. You rolling? All right, good, good. All right. Okay, so good morning. Thanks for, <laughs> thanks for uh, having joining me for the interview this morning. So we're going to just talk about some uh, about your career and also your own history and how you got interested in economics and how it was that you came to be involved with ERPI. So why don't we start at the beginning and why don't you just tell me a little bit about uh, your you know where you were born, your upbringing, and those sorts of things. Well, I was born in a place called Shanks Village, outside of New York City. My father was staying there while going to Columbia Law School in 1949. It's basically post-war GI, um, back to school education. While he was at Columbia, he did actually run across Paul Sweezy, had a couple of teas with him, apparently. Um, he took a course from Fritz Macklup, which he thought was the most absurd course in economics anyone could ever possibly take it, and he, um, he decided not to take anymore. Prior to that, as an undergraduate, he was at Hamilton College. There was an economist there called Gams, John Gams, who's written a textbook um, against supply and demand, I believe, but also helped form the Association for Evolutionary Economics. Uh, so that was his kind of background. Um, he became a labor lawyer, worked for the National Labor Relations Board in Washington, D.C. My mother was a social worker, became involved in civil rights movement, 50s and 60s. Um, so the family was fairly progressive um, to the left. Um, in spite of my grandparents, probably um, um, chagrin, they did actually buy them for Christmas present, um, State and Revolution by Lenin. <laughs> um, and so we, so I come from a, an unusual background in that way, at least with relevance for economics, is that I knew by the time I got involved with economics that there was something different. Not that I knew a great deal about what was meant by different. Not that I knew anything about Marx, even though I, I read volume one, probably a couple of times, um, various um, shorter pieces of Marx, because we had all these collected works um, in the house. Um, but I knew there was something different. Um, my father also had Pierre Schraffer, Joan Robinson, and Maurice Dobb on his bookshelf. So the issue was something different, but not really knowing anything. Um, basically, not stupid, but ignorant with least eyes are open. It's the best that one can claim, at least I can claim for myself, somewhere up until my early 20s, early 1970s. Um, the Vietnam War, social rights, civil rights, not so much feminist or gay movements, mostly outside my things which I would have, have recognized at the time, growing up in an upper middle class neighborhood environment outside of Washington, D.C. Um, but I knew of these things, and over time, if you became aware, I should say, you realized that there was, you heard enough rhetoric to realize that people are making connection between the kind of economic system you're in and these particular kinds of events, even though you had no real clue about the nature of the argument that would connect them. 
but you're only 19, 20, 21, and coming from a fairly privileged background. Um, the more tr transformational process occurs, oh, sad, the, um, after my second year at university, I, for some reason which I can't remember, I, my interest in reading and intellectual inquiry um, took off at a rate which was three, five, six times more than the previous years. I should say, similar to what it was like before I became involved in sports in high school, things like that, which before I became a teenager with testosterone and all this crap. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I became more, more aware. And I also at the same time became aware in philosophy. I mean, 20 year old, 21 year old, philosophy at least, the early philosophers from Plato, Aristotle, onward up until about 19th century, asked interesting questions, and whether you liked them or not, um, and had interesting answers. And these answers were directed at society. Um, the mid 19th century, they become much more analytically oriented. The kind of questions they were interested in no longer seemed to be interesting. Marx, I would argue, felt the same way. And economics is what fills the void. And that's what it did for me. Because I have a historical background and a graduate degree in history. I actually approach economics as an historical subject. So for me, when you start having to read the stuff that comes from Jevons or Raul Ross, something has changed as relevant to Smith, Ricardo, or Marx. And of course, given the other social background, um, civil rights and Vietnam War or whatever, this reinforces this um, coincidental change in reading with regard to philosophy and economics. So that's what pushes me into economics. Mind I don't have any economics, but that's what pushes me into going into economics. Well, you're, you're a history major as an undergraduate, correct? Yes, yes I was. I've always wanted to be in history. Um, at least for Americans in their high school yearbook for seniors, they often ask, what do you want to be when you graduate, grow up, whatever? And I put down history professor. Really? In your high school yearbook? Yes. Wow. Um, I had always been interested in teaching, um, in teaching at university. Uh, more so. But you have to remember, I have one grandfather with a PhD in political science, a second grandfather with a law degree, a third a father with a law degree, and a mother with a master's of social work. Wow. Come from upper middle class educated elite. Yeah, I've seen your bookshelf at your home, and they, um, some of those books have been there for generations, very scholarly books that uh, you mentioned were from your grandfather and from other people in your family. Yes, that's, a, that's my background. That's interesting. So, the, um, so how did you get, so uh, how did you begin to study economics? How did you move away from uh, history and wanted to be a history professor and becoming interested in economics? You mentioned philosophy was that where you did you study philosophy as a student as well? Yes, I um, have a history undergraduate degree. Then I have um, I don't I have more than enough 
undergraduate philosophy courses to have a minor. <coughs> <coughs> but never had one. I took these even after I graduated. Um, basically, um, philosophy wasn't answering the questions, although some philosophy of science, um, Kuhn, lack of toast were interesting, interesting stuff. Um, history was damn too easy. Didn't answer any analytical questions anybody in their right mind would want to answer. Um, why anybody would want to study that? Economics is that combination of analytical examination of historical outcomes, how the damn world works. And where else would you want to go if you wanted to explain this stuff? And that's, I think, just bring that kind of stuff together. That's, that's what drove me in economics. Now the question is why heterodox, broadly speaking, non-mainstream versus mainstream is because I have a background saying that there's alternatives. So therefore, I was never subsumed by the mainstream as truth. Not that I actually knew why it was wrong or why the other stuff had more credence, but I was never indoctrinated so I could come in and ask questions, or better yet, I can ask my father. So let's talk a little bit more then about your economics training, because the, uh, your formal training, it sounds like you had already read uh, and been exposed to some of this material through your parents, and particularly through your father and his, uh, in, in his library. And uh, so, uh, so you then went on to Rutgers for your doctoral degree. No, no, well, no, let's got to step back before that. Okay. Um, the, this would be 1973, let's, let's just say that. I started reading economics. I have kept a record of everything I've read from 1972 thereabouts to the present day, and I can tell you, you can see the transition <coughs> to reading economics. So I wanted to read economics. Um, so I get married, my wife and I moved to New York City, and I, by that time, I wanted to do economics. Don't tell me precisely when. Um, the, um, so, in the spring semester of 74, I take Capital Volume 1 class at New School and a class on Theories of the Business Cycle by a guy named Kyler. Who, who taught the Marx class? Um, there was a young gentleman from Yale that got killed in a car crash, the Vine, and wow. he got replaced by Mr. Roosevelt. I see. This uh, is... Um, uh, Heimer, I'm sorry, Heimer. Mr. Stephen Heimer. Stephen Heimer got killed yeah. in an automobile crash, and Mr. Roosevelt um, stepped in to replace him. Oh, interesting. Didn't say that we got along that well. I was an opinionated idiot, but that's a... Frank Roosevelt? No, me. Oh, oh. I was an opinionated idiot. Okay, so you were causing trouble in the Marx class from the beginning? Yeah. Okay. Because I was totally ignorant. Um, okay. But that's... That's another issue. Don't tell me you were raising issues with the labor theory of value even in the volume one class. Indirectly. But like I said, um, this was based on total stupidity. Um, <laughs> I apologized to Mr. Roosevelt later on. Okay. Um, but, um, but I still want to do economics. And not that I want to do mainstream. Not that I actually knew what it was, but that's... Um, took a stat class, then went to Saudi Arabia for two years, where I started picking up through correspondent courses, intro micro, intro macro, things like that. And I come back after two years to Columbia. Columbia has a, an adult education program where if you spend the bucks and you're over 21 or something like that, you get to take the courses with all those other bright um, undergraduate um, kids from Columbia College which aren't overwhelmingly bright, mm -hmm. just to let people know. They come up through alternative ways. Um, then I, I learned my conventional economics, 
at least as one as an undergraduate, had a history of thought class from a guy named oh heck, a rich uh, a Russian economist. Um, starts with a K. I can't remember. Um, had a class with him. Had a class with um, John Eatwell on effective demand. He was at Barnard at the time. Um, so I came away with a fairly decent undergraduate education. Not, not fabulous, but then I started from nothing. And Columbia can't make up for nothing. Um, and then I got accepted to go to the University of Edinburgh. Um, the following year, this would be um, 76, 77, 78. Um, where they made claims about what they wanted to do, didn't match them. I stayed there a year. I basically learned all the economics I need to do, learned to go to graduate school that year, read everything. So when I went to Rutgers, <coughs> I was far more prepared than almost anybody um, to sit in to graduate school education, especially from a heterodox perspective. I was by then clearly um, Heterodox economist, in part because while I was at Columbia, um, I was told people got to know that I was this strange undergraduate, and I read all this stuff on pricing because I'm a micro person. Um, and they told me to go down the street and see this strange guy called Alfred Eichner. So I go down the street after reading Alfred, Alfred Eichner's Mega Corp book, I go down the street, walk into his office and ask him, do you want to talk about how the markup is determined? And that obviously resonated very well with a person who made part of his reputation over the determination of the profit markup. So this is at Rutgers, correct? No, no, this is at Columbia. Uh oh, I care, was at Columbia or was he? Yeah, no, no, York? he was at Columbia. He was at teaching at Purchase. I see. Um, he didn't come to Columbia until a year after I was there. But he was, but he, oh, so you went up to, uh, to see him at Purchase, or you saw him in New York? I saw him in New York. I see. Um, so then, um, so you prepared yourself through, uh, so you went some courses <coughs> at the new school, uh, some courses at uh, Columbia, and then a year in Edinburgh. And, the, and the Edinburgh was, uh, that had, um, you mentioned to me one time that it had an orientation towards uh, industrial economics? That's what they claim never showed up. Really? And that's why I left. Okay. Um, it was, um, I was also unprepared for the kind of system it was, even though I knew it, even though I thought I knew it. Um, be as it may, I've never considered that year a waste of time. I spent that year reading articles and books and taking notes. Like I said, when I showed up at um, uh, Rutgers, I was far, far more prepared than, generally prepared than any student. Only probably draw back with stats a little bit for econometrics. But since I didn't think that there was randomness in the world, it made it very difficult to take <laughs> stats in a kind of unbelievable grain, and certainly in the early 70s, where randomness was a requirement. Maybe things are different now, but um, that would probably be my only real drawback, and probably some mathematics. But I took my linear algebra independently of all this, so I, I caught up on the mathematics I needed to. So, so let's talk a little bit about Rutgers. So you studied at Rutgers, and by that time, Eichner was at Rutgers? He, he came my second year. The people who were there my first year, was Nina Shapiro, who was on my dissertation committee, um, Paul Davidson, Jan Craigel, and a guy named Alessandro Mercaglia, who had just finished writing a book. We're getting it translated on Schaff and the Theory of Prices. Uh, probably the first American to read it. Um, um, and he was first Italian in the United States to hear me say that I actually read your book. Um, a guy named Sergio Paranella who was there for a semester. Um, a very strong post-Keynesian connection when I first arrived. Now the visiting people left. I mean, I was 
nature of the appointment. But Nina Shapiro stayed. Um, had a great deal of importance to me in terms, especially about how to think about economics. She was very good. Um, Alfred came and um, and then was, those were the two major points on my committee. There were a couple of others from the program, but how was, your, how was your training there? Was it was, did you find it useful or it was conventional middle PhD program training. Um, not as good as I would have wanted, but it was uh, certainly in the micro. The micro could have been a little bit better, but it was it, it was adequate. I mean, other than going to set theory and whatever, it still covered the same damn stuff. So the theory got taught directly, but never critically. That's that's the only drawback to it. Um, the macro, I I screwed it around. Um, Davidson. Um, taught the first semester, and that was his take on macro, aggregate supply and demand, etc. Created a lot of general controversy in the department because it's a clearly a transformational process into rational expectations and all this new, new classical stuff, which he didn't bring in. But if you looking for something prior to that, it was it was fairly accurate and it was fairly good, and. If you did a little bit of work in the class, then you knew precisely what was going on. So I basically knew, coming out of that class, everything that any, quote, post-Keynesian macro person would know about macroeconomics. This is independent whether you're Davidson, Minsky, or anybody else. Um, it was completely thorough. Um, the second semester was going to be on modern growth theory. I got one of the most dull topics one could ever think of having to study. But I pulled a fast one and said, could I have my theories of the business cycle substituted, which I took at New School, for the second semester growth theories class? And they said yes. So I skipped out of modern growth theory, which that was a good thing. I skipped out of you didn't have to take a second semester of econometrics, Bayesian econometrics. Now that was a mistake. I should have actually have taken that. But skipping growth theory, I yeah. think, was a good move. But in its place, I took a course, a readings course from Jan Craigle, and where he had me read, in part, the um, correspondence between Herod and Craigle that had just turned up in volumes 13 and 14 and asked me to write about it because it dealt with the Oxford Economist Research Group. I did so as the class project, um, refined it, submitted it to the Oxford Economics papers that f following fall, in which got accepted, top 25 publication in a top 25 journal time. I don't know of any, like, I could be wrong, but I don't know of any heterodox economists of my age, of my time, who actually did something like that. I was lucky, but the point is, is that I got tremendous advice from an advisor. I could actually write something and send it to the right kind of journal who editor would be absolutely interested in such a topic. So, uh, what was Al Eichner's influence on you, do you think? Well, aside from somebody doing micro the way I'm doing it, which is almost impossible to find anywhere close to these, even today, those who want to do micro and see micro not as simply theory of the business enterprise or something, or theory of price, but something which is like a neoclassical view Microeconomics have a general framework about how we see the overall economy. Um, Al and I were on the same page. So it's different parts of it, but self reinforcing and supportive. Um, so, that, so that was very good. Um, we had different interests. He was obviously 
Well, he, I like the input output like that format. He has to come up to appreciate it. He knows other things which I'm not aware of, which I have to come to appreciate. We have these kinds, not issues, but things that we have to deal with. Um, so that's one aspect. The other aspect is something which people don't want to really appreciate, is that if it wasn't for his efforts to promote post-Keynesian heterodox economics, but mostly post-Keynesian, um, it wouldn't exist. Um, and that he did it not because it would benefit himself, but it would benefit the larger developing community. And that's, in large part, what I picked up from him. Let's just say that he sacrificed part of his career so that other people who are well known in the past now can have a career and they don't give a damn. So your, um, let's start talking about your work a little bit now. Why don't you start with your maybe your doctoral dissertation and oh, the themes maybe. that you developed in there, or yeah. Well, no, that's the place to start. Okay. Um, let's just say that my doctoral dissertation started off like everybody else's, trying to write about the world in 300 pages or less, <laughs> um, and that you bitch and complain every time your advisor says, well, you got to cut something out here. Um, students don't seem to realize that all of us have done this, so we talk entirely from experience. Um, we're not after them. But, um, so I wanted to write my dissertation on post-Keynesian microeconomic theory. I was going to write the definitive text. Um, it became obvious. I mean, they didn't have to do much pushing as you actually had to make a decision about how you're going to write, what are you going to write about. It comes down, it falls off very quickly, but that point forms the total background of everything I do ever since. So the beginning point of my dissertation is the beginning point, an end point, of my theoretical agenda. The, um, so I, I cut it down, and eventually I get it to the history of full cost pricing. The, the issue is that certainly at this time, when you talked about microeconomics, we're still very much associated with the neoclassical world, so it's price theory. Uh, micro and price theory coincide a great deal. So clearly how one talks about how prices are determined form a particular theoretical agenda within neoclassical theory and post-Keynesian whatever. So full cost pricing, which is a component of the development of, of post-Keynesian price theory is simply part of that. And the reason it's full cost pricing as opposed to administer prices by Gardner Means is because Jan Craigle made me read Herod and Keynes' correspondence, which took place in the context of the econ Oxford Economist Research Group, which is my first article. So that's why that particular one. Um, so I write a historical thesis, but it's not a historical thesis um, the way people write historical thesis today as being historiography with no connection with anything about contemporary theorizing. All of mine was directed towards developing, showing that full cost pricing develops into an alternative theoretic understanding about how prices are set, alternative to the mainstream. And that's obviously part of my agenda. So that's how my thesis comes out. The novelty of it is that it's the first thesis that I know of that combines um, oral history, archival research, 
uh, interviews, um, quantitative data, um, which a third to a half is generated new for the thesis as opposed to being already generated otherwise. Stuff which people start to take for granted these days, which in economics, which didn't exist when I did it in 1980. Um, and still people don't fully realize on these weird people who, with different kind of backgrounds that come into economics, who actually draw upon all kinds of research methods, <coughs> which economists aren't aware of. Um, and, and use them, don't use them very well because they don't have any, any real training in them, but they know about them um, and do adequate jobs. Um, people, instead of claiming, well, I've done all this really interesting stuff in the 1990s, 2000, um, should be a little bit more humble. Say that people, you know, maybe they were not very good jobs back in the 70s or 80s but they were jobs which did not utilize econometrics, for example, but alternative methods. Um, be, be a little bit more humble. There must be another dozens of people like me out there who picked up alternative ways to do this work, to achieve an answer where the conventional methods weren't appropriate. <coughs> so, so my dissertation I mean, I, I walked in my dissertation saying it can't be re rejected because the dissertation is supposed to have original material, and I've succeeded. So how did you develop it then? Uh, you're, you're, uh, in, in my mind, uh, you're well known for post-Keynesian price theory, and it sounds like that was there in the beginning of your dissertation, that that was the organizing theme of it. Yeah. And how did it develop from there? Well, the, the development of it is that at the time period, the 19, mid-70s, um, into the early 80s, which I'm a graduate student, et cetera, is that you already had a picture of a price theoretic framework of the economy. It's called Schraffian price equations. Um, now the question is how to work with that and how to work with it in a quantity model um, to deal with the Keynesian side. Now that was common discourse. It somehow dissolved in the early 80s. The Schraffians get shaft shafted. Um, and I won't go into that unless you really want me to because this is clearly sectarian activity directed at particular people. Well, why don't we stick with your okay, so, so the point is that, um, so you had this overall picture. And the question is, <laughs> what are some of the intellectual foundations for this kind of Schraffian price theoretic framework if you want to, don't want to believe that Schraff does everything. So what about a minister prices? What about Koletsky? What about um, full cost or normal cost? I was just filling in pieces of a puzzle mm -hmm. once you have the overall framework there. So that's, so that's in a sense how I come to be able to place a full cost pricing study into a framework which makes this individual study more sensible, but unpublishable as a, as a book. So that's why it then takes me another 10 years, so 13 years to complete this original agenda of putting in a minister prices and Koletsky and, and then tying it together in my post-Keynesian price theory book it comes out in 1998. The dissertation was simply three chapters of it. Mm. So that's, but that gives you the, the framework which I can then work with. So it was the, the, uh, in your, the first three chapters of the post Keynesian price theory book, I believe, maybe, I don't know exactly know the chapters, but is the history of full cost pricing. Yeah. That's right. And that's it. That's it. That's, uh, that's, that's how it gets set up. The point is, is that the initial starting point. Um, is not unusual. If I went out and claimed that I made a fundamental breakthrough of 
seeing the Schaffian price equation as being grounded, okay, it's been possibly grounded in full cost, um, administered in Kaletsky and stuff. Jan Craigle, um, Silo Slabini, and others would have had me on a chopping block. They would have claimed, very rightly so, that they had already done that, been there, other people are working on it. My contribution is a much more detailed and refined one. The other one is the fact that I sticked with it for my career. Seal Sabini was at the end of his. I mean, Eichner was in the middle of his until he died of heart attack. But, um, but this wasn't anything new. It was an ongoing research agenda by people who are interested in the sense developing a kind of micro foundations of how to oversee a pricing framework of the economy and marrying it to a macro. You know that there was the uh, there was uh, research at this time that trying to connect the Keynesian macro with the the Serafian post Keynesian micro that was going on at the time. There was a, there's a one or two books collected papers that were that came out of that. Do you feel like um, well, that was ever resolved or developed? You're referring to Murray Milgate and John Eatwell stuff. Yeah. Uh, the, a promise that was not fulfilled, and I would argue not necessarily on their, is their fault. I don't know the answer. This is one of the places I just don't know. Um, and I've encouraged people to try to figure it out because what shows up is this bifurcation between micro and macro post Keynesian. And somehow, those who don't like any kind of micro Schraffian input output, whatever, um, attack the Schraffians as being equilibrianists, Schraffians as being equilibrium. Maybe some of the Schraffians love equilibrium, but there's no necessary component of equilibrium in Schraffa. And even if there was, who gives a damn? You can always change this stuff. That's what the mainstream does. They don't like what Samuelson does. They go out and change it. They say they want to do this with it. Um, we have people who believe in religious doctrines and say, well, this is because if somebody said it, that must be true. Um, so it's, this occurred at this time. And I don't know the answer, but I do know that the number of people interested in any aspect of micro, utilizing subject areas that you would find in conventional micro, but dealing with them from an alternative perspective. <clears throat> the only people that I ran across were some couple of interesting, strange people from UMass. I think I ran across somebody from New School, Ray, somebody back in the 80s. Um, maybe some of the from American U, but there was no systematic development of such kind of students. And, and that was it. Where all this macro stuff comes out. Um, so, I, so I'm at a loss, actually, to explain what was going on. The only claim I could make was that that set back heterodox economics 15 years. Instead of having co-equal development, yeah. sectarian development sort of back at least 15 years. And by sectarian development, you mean the sort of the, the, the bifurcation of the macro and the micro, and subordinating <coughs> the micro, <coughs> subordinating the micro under a large uh, within that larger post keynesian yeah. project. That is absolutely correct. That's what I mean by sectarian. Now, we could talk about sectarian Marxist versus post Keynesian, but that's a different kind of question. Yeah. Let's, um, yeah, since we do have a, a limited amount of time, let's. No, we uh, don't. Okay, okay. I want to um, uh, uh, ask you a couple of questions about. Now, um, um, you know, I 
know very well your commitment to uh, making, to trying to improve the lives of working people. And I think that your work has been driven by uh, a strong passion and desire to try to make it, to, to try to improve the lives of working people. So can you talk a bit, to tell me a little bit about the connection between your, your work, your research, and your larger political commitments, or your... Well, this, this is interesting. Um, on one hand, you could say that it's fairly tenuous. I'm an academic who has lived mostly an academic life. Um, the, and that's true. And I don't find that a problem because unless you believe that I don't exist in the real world, then my teaching of students, just like training of students for job training on the job or anything else is part of helping them cope with the real world that I affect people in the real world just like anybody else does. So we're not separate from the real world. Those who want to make those claims actually want to deny the capability that academics have, whether mainstream, non-mainstream, whatever, to affect the world, especially the non-mainstream, because they never want to reject the notion that the mainstream, however defined, can affect what the world's like. They just want to make sure that we can't. So in that sense, um, I've always felt on an ongoing day-to-day -day basis, I have as much impact on ordinary people in the world as they live their lives as anybody else does. <clears throat> so, so in a sense, um, I reject the basis of such a question. Now, those who are activists do, down, do like to downplay academic roles. Um, I think it's unfortunate. I think it's a form of invidious comparisons. We have men are paying jobs, more control in quotes these days, but whatever. Um, and we don't seem like we're informed. And that could be a real good reason to be critical of academics. Um, the one, the, the people don't necessarily come out and say that about me, and this will lend into the Marxists as well, is that there's not very many activists Marxists or whatever, who help organize a union, um, or help vote in Teamsters Union, state of Virginia. Um, so it's uh, active on a job of unionization, I'm a member of a union in the UK and went on strikes, lost pay. I don't find very many of these people here losing pay over joining the union and going on strikes. Um, there's that. I do, I'm a member of the only radical trade union, trade union in the United States, Industrial Workers of the World. I don't know of any other academic economist who's a member of the union. I don't know if your membership is up to date. Up to date. <laughs> because of yeah, what? I'm, sorry, my, I'm a little behind on my dues. So okay, right. then you're not a member. I'm talking about bona fide update members. Um, and those who somehow claim that they're part of a union, but are, they're not. They don't want to be. So all these Marxists who claim to really be, no, they're not. They're not members of a union. They don't engage in these activities. And of course, one of the mottos of the union is to educate. This is precisely what I do. Um, so my activism, in this kind of sense, permeates everything that I do. It permeates how I get affected on the job. Um, people where they know the union by name know my reputation of that we should work as a collective, don't like sectarianism, don't like some departments thinking they're better than others, um, and all this kind of stuff. Um, so, so I wear the ethos of the IWW 
on the way I conduct myself in, you know, on the job. And that has paid negative consequences in the UK um, with regard to how I was treated on the job. <laughs> now you were, uh, uh, I know a little bit of this history, so uh, I know that you were, in fact, uh, General Secretary Treasurer of the IWW for a period when you were at Roosevelt, because you spent early in your career <coughs> at Roosevelt University in Chicago. <coughs> <coughs> yeah. yeah so, so, so early in your career, you were at uh, Roosevelt University in Chicago which um, at the time was also where the offices of the union were. And so how did you get involved with the IWW? Well, um, total circumstances. Um, it was um, 19, uh, goodness gracious, it had to be somewhere around 84, 1984. Um, the Haymarket Martyrs events were coming up, and a person had just written a book on the on the event, which was being reviewed by one person. It was Avery's book on Haymarket, being reviewed by another person who was writing a, also a book on anarchism in Chicago, and it was being also reviewed by a guy named John Beckin, who was a treasurer. Secretary Treasurer of the IWW. I went to it. It was one of these interesting meetings that they used to have in Chicago of strange people from the non-mainstream of anything getting together and listening to people talk. Um, so that's where I met him, and I started a conversation with him at that point and joined the union. Uh, the difference between most people is that I already knew the IWW existed through my father, so it wasn't something strange. Um, so that's how I joined them. John Beckin, who I've remained friend, friends with ever since, basically said after the first night, I knew I had you as a member because my particular attitude of how one should cooperate and work together um, fits very well within the nature of this kind of anarchist, syndicalist perspective, even though I wasn't terribly familiar with any of those terms. They, um, so I get brought in with basically a bunch of people who are my age, so a whole set of similar experiences ex externally in terms of civil rights, whatever. <laughs> um, and as in all cases, um, finding people to run organizations it's hard because anybody who can has already done it, and I know they never want to do it again. And those who haven't, you don't want to because they're incompetent. <laughs> so I was in the former class, and so I was a GST for a year. The only, well, the real claim to fame is that I was able to get Joe Hill's ashes out of the National Archives. Um, well, I was GST in 1988. Still a celebrated event in IWW history was the, that, was the return of Joe Hill's uh, ashes. Uh, that and is where, correct. And where were they? Uh, where are they now? Where were they disposed of? Uh, they were disposed of. Not entirely sure. I was time all that was done. I was out of country and teaching in England. I see. So, so I'm not. In the UK. Yeah. So I'm not entirely familiar. Uh, and IWW calendar for 19, for 2015 will carry information about this mm -hmm. because it's the 100th centenary of his execution. I, I, for some reason, I'm, I believe that he's actually, that they interred his ashes at the Waldheim Cemetery with uh, the Haymarket Martyrs, but I don't know No, they sure. couldn't have interred them there. They're, they're not interred there. They could have been spread there. I see as opposed to being interred. I see. So since this is uh, part of the ERPI or Oral History Project, I want to ask you a couple questions about ERPI. When did you uh, become aware of ERPI? When did you become involved with ERPI? Well, I, I knew you were going to ask me a question, and I'm going to be as vague 
as when I've tried to think about how to answer them. Um, the, I cannot remember when I became aware of ERPI, although it had to be somewhere around 1980-81 when Michelle Naples was hired in the Douglas College, it's a women's college, at Rutgers. And I think that kind of have brought it home. But there was another woman there called Margaret Andrews, who's from Berkeley in Agricultural Economics. Um, we had a lot of meetings dealing with falling rate of profit, etc. So somehow between those two, I have this been the early 80s, no, sorry, mid 80s, that I became aware of ERPI in some kind of fashion. When did I join ERPI? Probably around 1986, I can't be sure. And I think part of the rationale was that if I'm going to ever think about submitting articles to an association, to a journal, I should actually belong to it. Um, the other thing is that being at Rutgers, surrounded by some Cold War um, liberals, Irby was not very well liked. I should step back. Nina Shapiro, I believe, could have been a member of Irby. And there was another person, Bruce Steinberg, at Livingston College, who was a member of RP. Um, so it was around there. Um, but people like Davidson or Eichner had no interest in, in RP. And although Craigle would have had interest, he was mostly in Europe. Uh, but the feeling was, you know, RP was not really part of post Keynesian. And the core of my intellectual development at this time, one would have called post-Keynesian. So coming into ERPI was slower. It's just part of being pluralistic among heterodox, as opposed to, oh, I want to be a Marxist, or I want to do this, that, or the other. Um, I mean, I've been reading Marxist stuff, whether I understood it or not, for a long time. But so in doing that, having a notion of a class economy, class system, which you don't get per se out of post-Keynesian, and certainly not in the same way out of institutionalists, but I have to say it comes from a Marxian background. So one could say that Marxian categories and forms of argumentation uh, class conflict was always there, but because I had this sh strong Schraffian development, it was always mutated by a Schraffian interpretation of it. Just because you don't have a labor theory of value doesn't mean you don't have a world in which capitalists determine how much profit is being generated by their own interests. Maybe articulated differently. So we're working in the same world, we're just arguing about it differently in a, in a sense. Um, at least that's the attitude. So um, I would say I was always engaged with Marxian argumentation, just like I was always engaged with post Keynesian or Schraffian or various kinds of institutionalists. And as I got older and other heterodox approaches, they were just brought in to help develop a, f a way to answer a set of questions. So it makes it a very amorphous answer. How did I come into ERPI? But what I can say is that in coming into ERPI meant that I considered ERPI on par with any other heterodox approach, which is not an attitude which you would normally get. So I'm an unusual person. Aside from early people, or like Bill Duggar, 
oh, who's that guy at um, Utah? Um, Howard Sherman, uh, it's, uh, E.K. Hunt. E.K. Hunt, who come in with Marxists into institutionalism or social economics or whatever. Um, I basically redo the reverse later on, coming with post Keynesian and then Marxists and things like that. Never thought them um, separate, and many, I would argue, many of the early post Keynesians didn't have this attitude. They were, let's not say. About John Robinson and that generation? No, no, I'm talking about young people in the 70s who were oh, in their 20s and early 30s. Never had these kind of sectarian problems. This stuff emerges in the 80s, and again, I don't know why it emerged in the 80s. And certainly you find it very strong in the UK. Um, you mean the, like the, uh, the divisions between all the uh, radicals and Marxists and post keynesians uh, Yeah. Oh, I see, okay. Um, so, the, um, so I don't know the answer. I can tell you descriptive histories, but I, I didn't answer anything. Mm -hmm. The, um, so, I don't know. The, by the time, well, I should say, is that Erpy, from the beginning, at least as far as I can tell, this would be the mid-1980s, I'm out there wanting to give papers at conferences. Erpy is up there straight forward and saying, yes, you can have a session um, post-Keynesian micro-theory. We want to cover this stuff. Institutionalists, you would never get anywhere. If I want to give a post-Keynesian micro-theory institutional economics, forget it. Or at least, it have to be some institutionalists in there. Like, um, Erpy was by far, and still is, the most pluralist um, association when it comes to developing theory. In fact, it's the only association among those at the ASSA who gives um, emphasis on developing theory. In that regard, ERPI is, for a person in theory, by far the superior association. I mean, I've tried to do it for AFI. It's difficult to get institutionalists to theorize. Uh, I've got, hopefully, for Boston 2015, a slight more theorizing than in the past. But ERPI is by far the most superior one, the most open, and the most generous with its time. Uh. So how is, uh, so it, is, this has been important in your own professional development to have ERPI as a, as a association and to provide those venues with you to try to work mm. through this, these things? Yes. Okay. So the, um, uh, <coughs> um, I'm going to ask a, a, a question which is uh, um, having to do with uh, what, it, what it's been like to be a radical or a heterodox economist in the profession more broadly, do you feel? How, how do you feel that that's um, uh, challenged, been a challenge? Uh, in, in what degree has it influenced your, your life as an economist? Well, uh, okay. The, the, we knew it was going to be a problem. I mean, anybody who had come up in the 70s, heard tales, whatever, knew it was going to be a problem if you're a heterodox economist. If you're non-mainstream anything in whatever discipline, whatever, you're going to have problems. Um, so, so, so you knew that. Um, the difference was set up until about 1974, the openings for academic positions was sufficient to absorb, absorb us without any great fanfare. The bottom fell out of the market the year after I was hired at Roosevelt. And then it affected everybody, including mainstream, but it certainly affected heterodox. Um, some of the problems that people had, even though I had it, I got lucky at the very end. Um, there was a person who taught it. Wheaton College up in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. uh, goodness gracious, I forget his name. Um, I applied for a one-year position, and they wanted to do micro, and I said, well, I can do um, post-Keynesian micro, 
and the chair f flipped out. Couldn't possibly conceive of anybody doing that. And that's been a continual problem, I want to call that in my academic career. Um, going to Roosevelt, it wasn't a problem. The department was controlled by Marxist heterodox economists, and I was hired precisely to do both mainstream and heterodox. Um, so that was never a problem. Then I went to the United Kingdom, I was hired precisely for what I did. Then I came here, I was hired for precisely for what I did. So in terms of ultimately getting jobs, I got them for what I did. When I was in the UK, I tried to get various jobs, and I wasn't hired for precisely what I did. But I already had a job. So the problems that people face, I also face, but I was able to get around them. I think one basis is that um, if you pers persevere long enough, you can do it. If you actually publish, many heterodox economists publish relatively very little. Um, I wouldn't hire them even, and I control the department, given a lack of publication and involvement in the profession. Um, if you're out there six, seven, eight years, you should have 15, 20, some publications, 20 conferences going to, all kinds of stuff. Um, you should, should have all that. Many of them don't. Um, so, so the problem is that there are some grounds of lack of real professional development, even in their own area. <clears throat> um, so, but there is still clearly that you get outright discriminated against um, if you're a mainstream. And I've written about this extensively. Um, like I said, I've been able to persevere coming in places or made right kinds of decisions where I've been able to, to get around it. The outcome is that um, whereas a person like myself or others, it should be at the equivalence of Harvard's or stuck at UM Casey's. That's, that's the difference. Uh, so let me, um, I want to ask you, I want to get back to your the theoretical issues one more time, um, which is we talked about the development of your of your <coughs> theoretical work from your dissertation through and your, your post-Keynesian price theory book. As you look back, what is the part of your work that you're most proud of and that, you're, that you hope is going to have the biggest, last, most lasting contribution? Okay. Let us start off with which... Um, part of my work, which I don't say I'm not interested in, but it's, um, it's not what I would have preferred to focus on. And that's all the work on ranking journals, all the work on the history of heterodox economics, all the work on the, the research assessment exercise, all the work on the sociology of the profession, or the history of the profession. I'm an economist. I want to do theory. I do all this stuff because it helped other people. So I spent 50% or more of my academic career doing work for others. So once you take that out, then what I want to have been recognized for is precisely what I do. My final publication, assuming I live long enough, is Heterodox microeconomic theory monograph. That's what I want to be known for. Or, I mean, I not only did my this book in 1998, um, which kind of gives a kind of historical background to some intellectual developments, um, stuff on the theory heterodox theory of production, which is in some kind of progress. Um, it's history. No, not. Um, post Keynesian, I'm sorry, heterodox microeconomic theory, dealing with theory about how one theorizes about how a capitalist economy works at the micro level to provide 
the basis um, on which one can also do what I would call macro. So there's no distinction between micro and macro. We're just doing economics. I just happen to like these certain things put together in a particular way and others like other things um, with no sec intellectual sectarianism between them. Um, that's what I want to be known for. What I will be known for is the fact that since I'm not sure I can get this stuff done, is all this stuff um, about ranking, which the irony of it is that people say, oh, I love this ranking. Would somebody else please do it? So they want to have their own career, have somebody else do the work, which will ensure that they actually have a career. Because the work that I do, almost nobody else seems to do it. The work that I do, I get thanks saying, gee whiz, because of you, I was able to get tenure. Well, if that's the case, and they should spend the next 20 years of their lives working for me. So uh, I want to uh, ask you, you use the terms um, you know, you talk about post-Keynesian micro, and you talked about heterodox micro. What do you see the, the, the difference between those two? Maturity on my part. Okay. Um, let's just say that um, in the 1980s, 70s, 80s, 90s, who would do micro theorizing? That was not labor theory of value based. Um, Post Keynesians. Um, in spite of what institutions like to say, um, let's just say that whatever theorizing they do really shows up as post Keynesian stuff. And it'd be difficult to say whether you're Marxist or post Keynesian or someone like me really said that it engaged in theorizing in a way that we would understand theorizing, even though we may disagree. So it was post-Keynesian. But as it became more conscious, more mature, in terms of recognizing the different aspects of the development of, of theory, the different components can be drawn in different ways from different approaches, then I've become consciously to recognize, in fact, that if I have class as a way to help set up this economy I'm dealing with, then I'm not post-Keynesian. I'm a Marxist. Even though post-Keynesians would say they have class, the others are fine. That's about 100 years too late to claim that you have class and nobody else does. Um, so, so in these kind of sense, I became more aware of the appropriate uh, contributions um, made made by others, and hence change it to heterodox. Um, <coughs> you've had a big influence on um, here in the de in the department at UMKC. <coughs> you okay. Do you have any uh, thoughts on um, UMKC and your? Uh, in your own life and in your development here? Um, the, um, the impact of myself on UMKC. Uh, or, or the impact of UMKC on you and your okay. career here. Well, let's take that one first to make it, because um, that can be dealt with um, much more straightforwardly. Uh, I'm a micro person, so what, what possibility can UMKC, who consider themselves macro, have on a person like myself? And the answer is chartless theory of money, which I knew about long before I came here, uh, but through listening to Randy or Stephanie, um, made it clear to me that I've um, been basically um, intellectually a sloth for 30 years for not bringing this stuff together where I should have done so much longer beforehand. And so it helps me put together a more comprehensive framework of the general economy as a whole, whether it wasn't for Randy or 
Stephanie or some students like Zethka or others, um, it wouldn't have been done. So that's, I consider that a major impact, but it's a major impact in a particular kind of theoretical conceptual way. <coughs> um, the um, institutional stuff, there's some impact there, going concern nature, which I kind of knew about before, <coughs> but became more emphasized here. Um, resources become, um, which is a noticeable advance. So the outcome of this is that there's no such things as rents anymore because resources ceases to be these natural defined entities, but are socially constructed and kind of inputs. Um, that comes out of Marxian literature as well, but it's clearly in the institutional. And these are important contributions, which I wouldn't have come across if I wasn't here. Uh, so these are the ones I can trace to, to coming here um, from my colleagues. The, my impact, aside from the structural impact on maintaining programs or developing the program, in terms of theoretical, um, if you'd asked me five or six years ago, I would have said I would, had no impact whatsoever at UMKC. Students had no interest in taking me in classes, doing dissertations under me. Um, I was a non-entity. And micro, as far as most of the students are concerned, <coughs> was an unimportant area. Um, this has changed, and I'm not entirely sure why. Unfortunately, it will benefit. I will get none of the benefits from this change. But it has changed, so there's more interesting interest in modeling in a broader, grosser sense, which includes what I would identify more as kind of micro stuff I'm interested in, but other stuff. Um, that they're more interested in, in non-money, non macro topics of a variety of sorts. Not necessarily all what I would call traditional micro. I'm a, I'm a traditional micro person in that regard. Uh, but there are in, in alternative ways of different levels of the economy, different stuff. And that's, and that's good. I'm not sure why precisely that's the case. Um, I think it's since too early to tell. Um, so some of my um, work could prove useful, but of course would have to be repeated, otherwise it doesn't become part of the general framework in which people learn with it. Here. So. so before we conclude, we're um, maybe uh, want to conclude fairly, fairly soon. Is there anything that I haven't asked you that you want to discuss? Um, the, um, This is, this is for Irpy. You may want to ask, I'll ask it for you. In order to survive as an organization that will have a foreseeable role in the teaching of the training of highly skilled economists, i.e. PhD students. What does ERPI need to do to achieve that? And my answer is going to be a very, an answer which people may not want to hear. All the emphasis on activism outside someplace doing something is fine, it's great, except for the fact that you already presume that everybody knows all the economics that underpins this activism before they get there. And who's going to teach it to them? The answer is nobody unless they're trained as PhD students who become teachers.
<coughs> so the major emphasis of RP is to train academics. That's its major purpose. And the only way that you can train them is to develop primarily PhD programs and secondarily MA pre programs and BA programs as feeders. If they're not interested in developing these sorts of programs, then they might as well just quit because there, there'll be nobody there. That means it needs to provide ways to um, provide funding for st doctoral students to en enroll in doctoral programs that actually teach heterodox economics, not neoclassical Marxism, not something predicated solely on game theory, not something which is all mathematics or econometrics, um, something which may actually have them actually read not just Marx or Rosa Luxemburg, but also require them to read a whole range of, of heterodox stuff, which is not this wishy-washy stuff you get out of some places, but some real serious stuff. Um, but the point is, there should be a mechanism in ERPI to generate wow. such funding so that students can go to school, wherever the program exists, to get that. Um, and on top of that, those who teach in these programs should have in a sense, first rights to publication. So you teach at a small college who turns out one person, if you're lucky, every 10 years who may go on to a PhD program. History. Are what these people actually um, are right, terribly important. So are the people who's, whose writings are important are the one who trains the PhD students and they should be given first access. These are the important people. I'm not justifying how this goes out. But the point is that these are the people who are affecting the given crop of students that we have. And these are the ones who need to be supported. Um, this is not a popular one. It's certainly not an egalitarian one. But it's one that ensures that those who publish and teach the students that become the next generation of the teachers and researchers that influence the attitudes and interests of Erpi get promoted. And that is what's important. Uh, that's the kind of question that Erpi should be asking. All right, well, I think uh, we've covered a lot of ground here. Should we conclude? Unless it's 10.30, um, that session end starts at 10.30, right? That's correct. Um, I won't make it there before 11 or whatever. I'm not, if I make it there towards the end, that would be fine. But I'm not, I'm not pushing, I was never pushing it to go to it at the beginning. Okay. Um, so if you have a question that... It's kind of your favorite bugaboo that you might want to ask me. No, I, I, I think you know I, I got the, uh, you know I, I asked the questions that I wanted to ask, and I think I, you know I wanted to give you the opportunity to ask a question there at the end too, which you were able to uh, ask and answer about what Erpy should do. So, the, um, I would certainly want to reemphasize uh, is that I have found Erpy to be the most open, theoretically, um, association that's existed 
in the last 30 years. If it wasn't for Paul Davidson and the rejection of the forming of an association for, for post Keynesian economics, we, that could have been a possibility. Fairly small one, but that could have been a possibility. Um, and if Rope had done something like this, that would have been of interest too. Mm -hmm. But they didn't. I would suggest that if ERPI develops its, its 50th year anniversary, you could ask a question, if it wasn't for ERPI, would there be any post Keynesian economics left? Because where did all the young post Keynesians get their chance to deliver papers in the 1980s? It certainly wasn't through post Keynesian economics or through AFI. Um, and certainly, um, not until the latter 80s, early 90s in the UK. You can read about that in my History of Heterodox Economics. But the point is, is that ERPI provided something that nobody wants to acknowledge, um, and it should be emphasized. And the fact that there is some notion that the sectarian um, nature of ERPI, let's just say that the sectarian nature of whatever it is, and there's aspects of it there, is far less than found in the other associations. Um, I think that is what endears, that's what ERPI people find endearing about me. They know my theoretical position, but it's immaterial. Um, it's something like that should be emphasized there must be others in other areas um, which intersect with ERP and other heterodox associations which you can emphasize. Um, ERP, ERP doesn't promote itself well enough and are poignant enough to deal with this stuff. Um, If ERP comes out and says, well, you know, we're in fact um, much more pluralistic than ASE or AFI and set out a particular set of reasons and invite associations to engage, it would be interesting because it then would depend on who's the chair or the president of and how the debate would take place. Um, I'm tired. My fear <coughs> is that all this work I put in to developing a heterodox framework can be destroyed in a few years by those who want to be sectarian. And people from this program are not immune to that. Off the record, the discussion about changing the qualifying exams to get rid of the interdisciplinary part it seems to emanate from some interest among students that they don't want to be interdisciplinary. And of course what we mean by interdisciplinary is that you damn well better know feminism, Marxism, post-Keynesian, whatever. They want to remain sectarian. That's, so it could come from people coming out of UMKC. It's very difficult to tell people that maybe your framework is too narrow. If I had more of a pre-just position towards broadness, but I could have been perhaps attacked in the early 80s of being too narrow. Um, one is not perfect and one can certainly live and learn. And I certainly 
have done that. So, um, pluralism and uh, <coughs> that, that you've been a strong advocate for pluralism, particularly in the last uh, 15 years since pluralism has become more of an issue. Do you want to talk a little bit about pluralism and the value of pluralism? You sort well, of have reached into it there. Yeah. Uh, what I meant by pluralism was the engagement of alternative theories. What I don't mean by pluralism is that a whole bunch of different theories can just be there. For me, pluralism says that you're tolerant. doesn't mean that the various components of the different frameworks actually are coherent or have any substance. They should be dismissed. Uh, one can say, yes, I should need to listen to Marxism, feminism, etc., draw from what I can. doesn't mean that what they're saying is right. Um, pluralism is often used as a way to legitimize one's pet viewpoints and never have them called into question. So I make that kind of distinction between what people like to talk about pluralism and being open to alternative frameworks and then getting rid of the crap that's in the frameworks, whether it be post Gainesian, and Martin, whatever, I don't care. Um, so, so that's how I, how I have a particular kind of differentiation between what I mean by pluralism. The um, pluralism, I've always had this issue within pluralism because my position has been to develop a, a heterodox theory, not a pluralist theory. Um, heterodox theory is a coherent theoretical explanation about how capitalism works, um, whatever that entails or doesn't entail. Um, and most of the responses is that, well, what about this or what about that would seem to be in contradiction. My response, well, then you get rid of something. That's not the response they want to hear. Um, so I walked this kind of thin line between pluralism, which they want to deal with, and developing a, an alternative framework. Pluralism to me is being tolerant. That's just because we disagree, and I think they're totally wrong. Doesn't mean they shouldn't be part of the community. We shouldn't engage with them. That we shouldn't hire them, et cetera, et cetera. They're all part of the community. So I think of pluralism more of civil rights action as opposed to whether one should have it as part of one's theory. That's not an issue of civil rights. That's simply an, ex an issue about how to explain how the economy works. And that doesn't admit wrong answers. We just fight over what we think is right, but without a way to destroy other people's lives. Um, I don't think, I mean, I think pluralism is come, came at a particular juncture with the development of heterodox economics or whatever, in that um, how do you bring different people together? Um, even though heterodox economics has a long history into the 80s of trying to bring p different people together. How do you really do that? Pluralism helped s overcome some of the edges at a particular period of time, but has no long-term lasting impact. Um, in spite of what people want to say, we basically just want to be economists. We just want to talk about theory, to talk about applying the stuff. We're not interested in the fineries of pluralism. And even though I've written about it, I'm not interested either. I'm an economist at heart, just like everybody else. Shall we conclude? I guess so. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to. Uh, Engage you very long, though. You've actually you're you're seen very strong right now, and your voice is very strong. Uh, we'll see. Okay. We'll see. All right. Um. The, um. Hope this goes well. I understand I'm the first one. You are, yes. Um. This probably means that I'm going to zero what I say. Will actually make it because <laughs> it will give you 
ideas about how to do things differently, what kind of questions you may want to ask and take off. Don't worry about it. That's just, that's just what happens when you're the first person who's, who's on the block. Great. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, actually, we'll cover a little bit of this mm -hmm. tomorrow. Good job, gentlemen. All right. Thank you. And um.